Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Your Crisis Coach with Scott H. Silverman and me, Fred Carroll. Today, we're going to talk with our friend, Liana, who is a, well, we'll let her tell you what she is exactly. So, Liana, you tell us who you are and what you do. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, my name is Liana Purgis. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, um, and I work in private practice as a therapist, uh, primarily with individuals and uh, families and couples who are navigating um, addiction. And I also work as a coach doing kind of similar work. Scott, I saw you light up when she said navigating. Scott loves the word navigating. <laughs> He loves the word navigating. He loves pressure burst pipes. And he just loves everybody that is involved in helping communities and people survive. So what do you got for there, Scott? You want to ask her some questions since you're the pro? Yes, I will, Fred. Thank you. I love the way he likes to set me up that way, Leanna. Keep an eye on him. <laughs> so what part of the country are you in? Just out of curiosity. Yeah, um, I currently live in Colorado, just outside of Boulder, um, and originally I'm from New York. Currently, so are you planning on moving soon? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't know. Sometimes I do really miss New York, and especially the food. Yeah, yeah. I have a, I have, I have a daughter living in Manhattan, so uh, and she's you know she tries to eat salads, and you know gluten-free stuff so it's, I, I don't think of new york as gluten-free i mean you know as they say no. you can go out to eat every night and never duplicate where you go out to eat so so tell us you know as, as fred said i like you know i i'm a you know a interventionist and a crisis coach and and i really think of myself as a family navigator uh, i'm not a clinician and mm -hmm. so what i do is i i get people i hopefully get people to get themselves pointed in the right direction to get the highest level of help and care and run our treatment centers. So I also sit on a variety of different um, committees around town, the, the DA's opioid task force and um, uh, SME when it comes to, you know, the opioid crisis, I call it epidemic. That's my new book, the opioid epidemic. And my goal is to try to, you know, help save lives. So tell us what you do in your work and your career and your passion and and what you do and more importantly why you do it i think that's something that people like to hear and understand and the fact that you're already a navigator is is uh very neutralizing and helpful and and i think it, it serves with what's going on in today's world if you're not a navigator you're probably sitting in a silo and um probably not being as effective as you can, because the, in my opinion, the world's changed a lot in the last three years. Yeah, and uh, there was, I just read an article an hour ago, somebody sent me how, and I'll let you go. Loneliness now is a bigger issue than alcoholism and smoking. Mm -hmm. I hadn't had a chance to read the article yet, but I, I don't disbelieve that at all. And I think loneliness became a whole new foxhole for people. And, you know, through the ep epidemic that we've had with, uh, with COVID. So, Anyway, the stage is all yours. You've got the microphone. So what do you do? How do you do it? Why do you do it? Yeah, no, great question. Um, so, yeah, I would say I'll start with the why. Um, so I started my career as a teacher. Uh, I was a special ed teacher in the South Bronx. And I loved teaching, but I definitely had a lot of kids coming in with a lot of trauma. Um, and I didn't know how to help them. Uh, you know, it's not something, at least when I was in school, that wasn't something they prepared us for at all. Uh, we had no training in mental health whatsoever. Um, and so eventually I decided to go back to school and get an MSW to become a therapist. Um, and, you know, it was interesting because also during my teaching years, I was going through a lot of changes in my personal life. Um, I found out at the age of 20 that my mother had a drinking problem. Um, and like a lot of people with substance use disorders, she hid it really, really well from me and my brother. We had no idea. Um, and so, you know, that was kind of like a big bomb going off in my life. Um, and I struggled with a lot of anger for a lot of years, a lot, um, you know, and I, I look back now and I, I wish I had known then what I know now, which, you know, of course, a lot of us do, right? Hindsight's always 20-20. Um, mm. But I think a 
big thing that impacted my relationship with my mom was my anger towards her because of her disease. And it, and it, even though I had learned a lot about addiction as a disease and, you know, it's not like she chose this and whatever it's, there was just so much resentment and anger coming out of me. And that's, and I didn't know how to handle it. Um, let me, let me, let me stop you there for a second. Cause I'd like you to kind of ex expand on that a little bit. Yeah. I think that that's really normal for people. So tell yes. us a little bit about the anger. What what triggered it? And then once you recognize you had it going on, what were you able to do about it? Yeah. So, you know, I think one thing that triggered the anger was I grew up in an environment with my family of origin where anger was one of the only socially acceptable emotions to express. Um, sadness was not safe to feel or express or talk about, but anger was. There was a lot of anger, a lot of yelling, a lot of throwing things, a lot of all that stuff. That was a constant. Um, so I think for me, that was just super easy to access. It was just always there on the surface. Um, it was harder for me to go deeper and understand that what was underneath was a lot of fear and sadness um, and disappointment and things like that. Um, so yeah, that anger usually looked like a lot of yelling, um, and, and at my mom for sure, you know, I, you know, helping her get to different treatment facilities and things like that. And being on the phone with her, there was a lot of anger coming out of my mouth towards her, but I'd also say a lot of anger coming out of me towards everyone in the world. Um, I was just always on edge, always angry, always anxious. Um, and that's just how it came out of me. Um, and I think primarily it's because I didn't know how to access anything else in me at that time. So, so growing up from what I'm hearing is anger was a platform that your family exchanged, you know, communication. So mm -hmm. when your when your reality popped and your mom was going through this and you found yourself angry, was it, was it comfortable for you to be angry because it was familiar or was oh, yeah. it a different kind of anger and you had to really figure out what it was or you knew right away? I mean, I think maybe probably a little of both. I think anger in general was comfortable and familiar. Um, that anger over that particular topic was new because, you know, like I said, I, I had no idea that my mom had any issues with substance use. You know, I look back now and I think, okay, as a teenager, when she would come into my room with what I thought was a glass of ice water, that was actually just vodka um, or, you know, things like that. I just didn't, I didn't know. And when, so when I started making these connections in my brain, I got really angry about it, really frustrated, irritable too. I'd say irritability was a big thing for me. I was always like one statement away from like yelling at someone. Um, I was just kind of always on edge. Were you angry with yourself as well because you weren't able to connect the dots or you didn't know there were dots to connect until way down the line? Looking back on it now, I think I was angry with myself also. Yeah, for sure. But it, it wasn't something I was aware of at that time. Got it. Yeah. And most aren't, you know, it's a, right. you know, and I'm, I'm a firm believer in, and I may be wrong about this, but I believe that anger is, is a shield many times for fear as well. Because you you know you and yeah. then and then with the naivete part of it and then you know and most families yeah you know, they go to a certain point then all of a sudden a flip is a switch is flipped and they're like oh my god how long has this been going on how did I miss this why didn't I see it and and yeah. now I have no idea what to do with my feelings because I don't know how to process this yeah is, so, is there a singular moment like from your childhood that now makes sense because you know your mother was maybe drunk or drinking? Um, you know, it's interesting. Like a lot of um, people who grow up with traumatic childhoods, I don't have a lot of conscious memories from my childhood. Um, but there are some things that, like some puzzle pieces that have, you know, started to come together. Um, like my mom would isolate in her room a lot. And my brother and I, you know, she'd like order a pizza for dinner, which in New York was obviously super easy to do, right? You get everything delivered. And, and that was dinner most nights. And we would just all be in our separate rooms. And now I look, you know, at the time, I didn't really think anything of it. That was just the norm. But now I look back on it and think, oh, she was isolating because she didn't want me and my brother to see what was going on. She was hiding. Um, so there are some things that now start to 
start to make a little more sense. Is she is she better? Is she better today? Sadly, no. She passed away almost two years ago now from an overdose. Um, unfortunately, she was mixing at the time alcohol, benzos, opiates. Uh, so she she passed away. Oh, I'm sorry to hear did, you. Did, Thanks. Yeah, I, I am as well. Did you have any time to sit with her um, towards the end and have a, you know a way to deal with your untreated trauma, obviously, and you still may be working with it? As you said, you know, it happens that you know, we, we, we do some heavy blocking around that because it's too painful. And, yeah. you know, un, untreated trauma to me is probably one of the major contributors to the mental health issues we're all having across the country. And, uh, you know, a major amplifier for those of us who are predisposed to, uh, you know, self-medicating over time. And I'm a guy in long-term recovery and I, I'm, I still go to six meetings a week virtually mm -hmm. just because, um, you know, there's still triggers that happen yep. and you know or losses that take place and you know if you don't know if you don't know what you don't know and you don't know what to do to do with it it, it generally doesn't get better on its own scott so, doesn't yeah. scott doesn't like to say it but he is 40 years clean 40 wow. years wow congrats right Thank 40 you. you hit 40 now, it'll be coming up in November, 39 mm -hmm. years and so many months but you know i i look at that as you know i'm only as good as my my uh, my serenity today, because you know how it works, you know, and and it, it wasn't it wasn't in my family, you know, but with the isms grew over time, sure. food, gambling, with with my mom and my dad was a huge enabler, but they were basically you know present, I guess you could say as parents, but you know I was the black sheep, so you know you know anything about your your field, you know where I was at, pretty much alone and. Uh, so at the end of the day, uh, what what is it you're doing? Because oh, I want to get back to our original question, so you get mm -hmm. a chance to really let people know who you are and what you're doing. So what was what happened with your mom? One of the pivot points to to get into the field that you're in, or was there something else that kind of? Because I think I heard you say you went back to school to get your you know LCSW certs. Mm -hmm. So what stimulated that? Um, yeah, so that was a piece of it, but I don't think I realized how big a piece or how big a, uh, an influence that was on my decision until much later. Um, mm -hmm. You know, at the time I was teaching and I was always the one who said, uh, you know what, there's this kid in the hall throwing a tantrum and like throwing tables and stuff. I'll go hang out with him and help him deescalate. Why don't you go teach math or whatever? You know, I was always just volunteering for this stuff because I just loved it. I was drawn to it. And I, and now when I look back on it, I'm like, Oh, okay, yeah, because there's some part of my brain that 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 really truly empathizes with that kid who's so dysregulated and can't handle all these big emotions, so they're acting out behaviorally. Um, but yeah, at the time, it was more just like that seems really interesting. I'd like to do that more. Um, so yeah, I did go back to school, and um, that was that was a huge turning point for me uh, personally too. I think I had the most growth personally from getting trained as a therapist and having a context and understanding all the stuff behind what I was experiencing. Um, you know, I had done therapy for many years, but that was a huge turning point for me. Um, I also did go to Al-Anon for a few years. And I think for me, that what the biggest thing I got of that was just the community where I could go to a room and say things that I would never say to anyone else because I would get really, <laughs> I mean, understandably kind of judgmental comments back. Um, but whereas in an Al-Anon room, I could say these things and people would just nod along. Like I would say, you know, at the time, I was scared every time the phone rang. I was scared someone was calling to tell me my mother was dead. Um, and literally, that's what my brain thought. Um and if I said that to someone outside of the rooms, they would look at me like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> like, Why would you think such a thing, you know? Whereas in an Al-Anon room, I could say that and everyone would be like, yeah, I totally get that. that how could you not think that? Um, so, you know, for me, that was also a big piece of wanting to do this work was really getting that sense of community and that sense of belonging of like, yes, there are these people who have who also have those same thoughts and feelings that I do and that's normal and it, there's nothing wrong with me for thinking and feeling these things
Yeah, it's interesting that my my children lost their mother to addiction uh, two years ago yesterday or something like that. Oh, and no. my daughter, who is 23, something like that. I'm a father. I don't actually know the age of my children. <laughs> but 23, let's call her 23. So she's upset sometimes at herself because she's her growth since then has prospered because she no longer has the worry every morning of whether her mother died last night. She yep. knows her mother's dead and she feels guilty feeling that way. And I try to tell her, I think it's the most natural, normal feeling in the world is to it shows both sides of you. It shows you are willing to love somebody that was an addict and it shows you're willing to love yourself at the same time. It's a very twisted, confusing thing, especially for young women who are trying to live their life and become something. So I see it in her and I hear it in her. And I think every day she's seeing the better sides of her mother rather than the bad sides of her mother. And um, enjoying those moments, whether it's through a picture book or memories. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and this is something I, I do a lot of work with, um, with my clients on is you can have multiple seemingly conflicting emotions about someone or a situation. Um, that's how human emotion works. It's very complex, right? So like I could be, that was, I think one of the best takeaways I got from, you know, my own personal journey is, I can be mad at my mom for some of the choices that she made over the years. I can be, um, I can sympathize for her for having this disease to begin with because I know it's not easy and she didn't choose it. And I can love her and I can be frustrated with her and I can have all these multiple feelings all at the same time about her. And that doesn't mean I'm bad or she's bad. It's just um, we're human and that's how we experience emotion. Yeah. Do you feel, because you, you, you look and sound very young, and, and my question is, do you feel, knowing what you know about the field of helping people, that having this lived experience uh, will not only add value to your ability to support others, but also help you on your journey in your life? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And um, I'm 40, just FYI. <laughs> so I like to say I'm young-ish. Um, but yeah, I I absolutely think it has a huge impact. Um, you know, I I do work with a lot of people struggling with substance use or some other kind of um, addiction like gambling. Um, but I also do a lot of work with the families. So the adult children, the spouses, the, you know, friends and family, whatever the relation is, um, because it does affect everyone. It's, it's, and it, and it, it just sucks. I think that's one thing that makes this disease so unique and so, so, so challenging is that it impacts the whole support system, um, not just the person who has the disease. And so it just makes it so complicated. Um, but yeah, I, I do think that experience helps me. And, and I feel like, you know, the feedback I've gotten from clients is that they appreciate like the normalization of the feelings like we were talking about that it's okay to be angry and it's okay to have all these different feelings about this person and that it doesn't mean you don't love them it, it actually means the opposite you do love them you wouldn't feel all these different things about someone you don't care about yeah it's very really good point yeah she's very you're very intelligent the one thing we the one thing me and scott bring the guarantee we give is when you come on our show you're going to be the youngest and best looking in the room. <laughs> okay. So me and Scott guarantee that with every show, right, Scott? You agree? Well, and, and, and the smartest brother. And, <laughs> and, and the most intelligent. So that's the good thing about coming well, out. That, that's a good ego boost for me. It's so thanks. Great. I appreciate that's it. That's what we're here for. That's what we're here for. But obviously me and Scott also have a lot of fun, but we yeah. do, we do care. And we, Scott does it this is Scott's full-time thing and he deals with the one question I wanted to get in in case Scott's got a run or something is you, you living in Colorado, right? So yeah. we talk about Scott deals with the homeless a lot 
um, you got Colorado did something interesting with homeless, right? Where you rehouse and stuff. Do you see it? And do you ever have to deal with that? Do you deal with anything to do with the homeless? Not currently. Um, I have in previous jobs that I've done, but not now in private practice. Do you see a benefit to what Colorado did? Um, you know, I haven't read much about it specifically, um, but, you know, I, I applaud Colorado for trying, um, you know, look, we don't know until we try some, an intervention, if it's going to work or not. So, yeah, I think it's great that they're trying different programs to see what might be helpful and, um, you know, and I don't know the numbers offhand, but I do know the opioid epidemic here in Colorado is very, very high. Um, we have a very high rate of uh, fentanyl use, very high rate of substance use in general, and a high rate of suicide compared to a lot of other states. So it's definitely needed. Yeah, it is. Well, and, and it, I think that's probably uh, systemic across the country right now. There was an article in, the, in our local paper yesterday that the medical examiner is about two years behind with getting mm -hmm. data around what's going on because they're so busy and they have to hire more people. And I think it was last year they rented freezing trailers for their, you know, this is the county of San Diego. We're a pretty good sized city, you know, and county. It's 3.3 million people. So all these studies that we've been hearing about, you know, with the overdose rates, are the, the, the real time data isn't there. And, and, you know, it doesn't get better on its own. So, you know, and we're, of course, a border town. So we see a lot of other things as well. So, you know, tell us, tell us what, what would you like to say? I mean, what haven't we asked you? But if you were to be asked a question that people don't ask you that you'd like to be asked, which is your now your opportunity to take it from your head or from your heart, what would you what would you want to tell us? What would you want our viewers and our listeners to hear from you uh, that you think that you need to say and they, they should probably hear? or would like to hear? Yeah, um, well, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is um, something you touched on earlier um, about self-medicating. And I think, I think a lot of people think substance use disorders develop because someone just really likes alcohol, this drug, that drug, whatever. And, you know, that can happen, but my experience is most of the time People are using it to numb emotional pain. They're using it as a distraction from whatever is going on, um, or they're numbing symptoms of trauma, something like that. It's usually tied into some kind of mental health issue. Um, and I think, you know, for various reasons, it kind of gets separated from mental health. But now I think these days it's starting to, you know, become more common knowledge. And I, and I think that's really important. Like this absolutely is a mental health issue. Neurologically, addiction alters the wiring in the brain and the functioning of the brain. Like this is a very real thing. This is not a, well, if you just really want to quit, you can have the willpower and quit. It's not that simple. Um, and so, you know, I think that's something I like to just let people know about. Like A, it's not easy to stop or to reduce use and B, um, you know, if you really truly want to get to the root of the problem, most of the time, you need to look at what else is contributing to your desire to use to begin with. It's not just about getting sober. It's also about addressing what's underneath. Um, so I always just encourage people to, I mean, obviously, you know, you have to triage, right? If you can't, do work on your mental health and therapy if you're, you know, high or drunk all the time. It's not going to work. You have to get sober first so you can think clearly, but then really do that work to get underneath and see what's going on there. You, you know, when, when I hear you, I mean, Fred will tell you everything you say, not only, you know, I resemble that remark, but it also resonates with me as well. And when I hear you talk about, you know, people really need to understand but what I've, I've learned in my experience, they don't, and they don't have the tools. And what I encourage people to do is make the phone call, you know, the, the three hardest words. And that's one of my topics tonight when I do the news is, is I need help. And most people, A, don't know how to ask for help. B, don't even think they need to ask for help. And if you're in the middle of, you know, 
under the influence or anesthetizing yourself or self-medicating, you, you don't even believe you have a problem anyway. Meaning if everything else was just fine, you know, if mom would listen or dad would listen, or, you know, if, if as a child, you know, I got more chocolate candy, I'd be, I'd be fine now. And if my friends and my colleagues and my coworkers fell in line, I wouldn't need to anesthetize myself. So having that person, that professional to, to not only share the information, but bounce something off of and glean the tools to, to navigate the badlands, so to speak. So that being said, how, how would someone get a hold of you? And, and, are, and are, is your practice very busy right now? You're looking to grow it? You want more clients or are you at a pace now that you're happy with? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, uh, currently in my practice am, um, I do have some clients. I'm not completely full right now, but obviously that's something that, you know, just changes all the time. Um, but yeah, my, the name of my practice is fuzzy socks therapy. Um, so you could visit my website at fuzzy socks I'm licensed to provide therapy in Colorado and Florida. Um, and yeah, I do individual, um, and family work as well. Why fuzzy Very socks? Good. Why fuzzy socks? Yeah. Um, so I, when I was thinking about naming my practice, I didn't want to use my name because both my first and last name are kind of unique and, and hard for people to know how to pronounce when, when reading. So, uh, I was like, well, okay, what do I like? to do for self-care for myself. And I thought of fuzzies, I really like wearing fuzzy socks, even if it's warm out sometimes, it just feels really good for me. So I went with that. Excellent. So so let me let me get this straight. Your, your thought process was, if I'm understanding you, I have a difficult first and last name, so I'm gonna go over to something simple like fuzzy socks. Yep. All right. Now we need it be fun to see what that bubble would look like over your head to see what was coming out of it. That's, yes. That is interesting. Oh, you don't want to get into my thought bubble. There's all sorts of crazy stuff going on up there. So be, before you know, before we ended, to... uh, before we ended, I wanted to ask, was there something specific in your mother's life traumatic that drew her towards alcoholism? Do you know of anything? You know, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know. She, like a lot of people struggling with substance use, did not want to talk about uh, her experiences and her feelings. Um, but I think, you know, she um, grew up with Holocaust survivors. And I think because of everything they went through um, and and their inability to even process what they went through and their trauma. Um, I think that had an impact on her. Um, and then that had an impact on me. Well, excellent. Well, that's all I got, Scott. And I know you got to short out, you got to get going to an event and we have more interviews later and you got to get to the news, but I want to thank you, Liana, for joining us. Um, people could find you on coaching with Liana on Facebook, I assume. Yep, on Facebook, and also uh, my website is fuzzysockstherapy.com. And I'll put that in the show notes and everything. And we like we always like to gather people. So is it okay if we ever have a question that pertains to an expertise level of yours, can we reach out to you with somebody or send somebody your way, maybe that calls in from Colorado and or Florida, I guess, right? Yeah, for be. sure. Okay. Well, that's always good to have. That's something new we're trying to do is gather people that we could bounce. Because we don't know everything and we don't know how Colorado versus California. I'm in Connecticut it, and it's all over and people ask for help. We want to be able to find them the help as fast as possible. So, okay. So that's going to be it for your crisis coach. You got anything to say, Scott, or no? Or you want me to close it out? I, I just want to say thank you. It was it was fun. I, I would like love, love to have you come back uh, sure. and talk with us. Sure. And you know, one of the things we're trying to build now is is get questions from our our audience to um, let us know ahead of time what's on their mind, so we can kind of shape our process of thinking. Uh, and there's really you know there's no boundaries about you know somebody says hey how do you grow corn in Kansas I I can't help you. But if it's in my, you know, wheelhouse, uh, you know, we want to do whatever we can. And as a navigator, I, I help 
senior citizens who fight with their neighbors over trash cans uh, personally as part of my service. If, if they, they, and I've had many calls around that because that's what I help do is help people navigate. So that's it for me, Fred. And, and Leanna, really great meeting you and talking to you. And thank you for your, your story and your honesty and your passion. Uh, and, and it sounds like you suffer from a high level of integrity as well. And I admire that. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, I do. But yeah, thank you so much for having me on. This was great. And yeah, no problem. Okay, so this is your crisis coach with Scott H. Silverman and Fred Carroll. And if no one has told you they love you today, we love you. And we will see you again next week. Goodbye, everyone.